This is Roger Sacolato. I'll be covering the FIMS Repository Interface Implementation Guidelines, Section 9, Reading Content and Essence. Okay, um, for objectives, um, we're going to cover how to read content and essence from an asset repository. And the presentation will describe the basic operations that can be used to accomplish that goal. For concepts, it's pretty simple. We're just going to look at content operations, essence operations, and storage accessibility. And it's recommended that the webinar sections 1 through 8 are uh, watched before uh, starting on this webinar. So this presentation is going to be um, presented primarily from the point of view of the user, although there will be some information that can help uh, an implementer on the server side as well. So we'll cover some of the mandatory uh, operations uh, and cover some uh, important secondary notions like synchronous versus asynchronous operations uh, and how to deal with error results. So as an overview, uh, let's talk about content, essence, and orchestration. So in general, a FIMS repository service provides a standard interface to an asset repository. Uh, also be thought of anything from uh, a digital asset management system uh, to a uh, you know a sort of uh, small small-ish scale video server um, to even uh, just a, a file system uh, that's acting as some sort of archive. Um, so at, this is a repository of assets. Assets themselves are media objects with a common structure shared by all of our services and this is the BM content which will be described uh, later in the webinar. Um, assets uh, have identifiers, uh, they have content, which is uh, metadata, and they have essence. And these are media files. And so uh, content is really the abstract and physical representation of multimedia essence. What that means is the abstract part of this is the sort of uh, metadata aspect descriptions, you know, what this content is about, who created it, when was it created. The physical representation uh, includes things like the formats of the essence, uh, what the, the compression or encoding is, uh, you know, how many tracks, um, and also location, uh, which is, you know, where, where are these files stored in a, in a storage system? Where can they be found? Uh, one important thing to note is that content does not require essence. It, it can just exist by itself as, as the abstract representation. Um, but essence does require content. It, it, essence is not addressable by itself. It has to be referenced through content. So content versus essence. Uh, content is initially stored as a BM content type object. As mentioned, this, this is the sort of standard FIMS representation for um, a content object or an asset. Um, Essence is uploaded to the repository after the content is uh, created and as such that the, the sort of format and locator, these are those uh, physical representations of the Essence, the content format and the Essence locator objects are added to the content record. Uh, what's important to know here is that multiple instances of Essence can be uploaded to the same asset. So, for example, we start with uh, asset creation, where a BM content type is, is added to the repository. No, no essence yet, it's just by itself. Now we do an essence upload, where we uh, create a content format type and essence locator type. Um, create the essence record up in the repository. Um, and we can repeat that operation. And uh, the standard example for this is high resolution essence for broadcast and uh, proxy or low resolution essence for browsing. And this, this can be repeated you know, over and over again. So orchestration uh, is the coordination of multiple operations. Um, these multiple operations uh, will be related to contents versus essence. So um, in order to, for example, retrieve essence, the first thing that has to happen is that you have to get the asset and then identify which essence that you want to download and then go and uh, retrieve that. And you really do need to check on the content because the essence might have been deleted even if you have a cached 
uh, essence locator uh, in your system, um, it's good to go in and check. But anyway, you have these multiple operations that have to be coordinated. Um, and for the purposes of this webinar, because it's a big topic, uh, it's the combination of content and essence operations on a single asset. Uh, now, it's, it's typically, orchestration is typically done by an orchestration engine. It's a dedicated service that runs business process scripts. And um, it, it handles all of the, this coordination, manages uh, intermediate results, etc. The, in, in our case, obviously, the uh, operations can be executed by a piece of code, whether it be a client application or some middleware, a anything that uh, can handle uh, calling the content, then calling the essence, and, and managing the uh, intermediate data in between. So let's start talking about uh, reading content. Uh, it's good to understand uh, you know, what content really is in this context and, and so we're going to say the content is a single time-based element it has a bounded contiguous stream it's finite it has a certain uh, fixed number of samples um, and the samples can be audio video and or data samples for example closed captioning or vertical interval uh, time code um, this is commonly called a clip and it's really like you know start record end record uh, and contiguous just means it has no gaps uh, in terms of uh, you know files that are broken up so um, content is normally associated with essence file but doesn't have to be and what that means is uh, that applications client applications sh should be prepared to look for essence on a, on a piece of content and not find any so uh, that's not an, uh, necessarily an unusual uh, scenario uh, you can just delete all the essence that goes with content leave the content in there for uh, its metadata purpose but uh, it's, it's not necessary that the essence files do exist so regarding IDs so all content must be uniquely identified when added to the repository the format for FIMS of this unique identifier is a GUID which is encoded as a string and this is a standard um, expression standard encoding method so the value of the identifier can be created by the repository there's a function called generate unique ID or it can be created by the client identifiers can then be used to get information from the repository with a get content call um, now identifiers do not have to align with the essence for example if you have a material uh, an MXF file with a material source ID that material source ID is a format that's specific to MXF it's a SMPTE universal media uh, material identification UMID um, so that that's okay as it is uh, the 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 unique identifier the GUID that we're involved in here is a FIMS ID and um, we can connect those to the native IDs that are in the essence and, and that way the repository can you know, map from one ID to a different one but in our context identifiers are stored as resource IDs in BM content objects as mentioned before the, this unique ID is a FIMS ID and does not have to be say the primary key in the backing repository so uh, as an instance if if an MXF uh, file is added uh, it's typical that the uh, material package ID is also the ID of the content this doesn't have to be the case for the FIMS interface so here's an example we have a FIMS repository service and a native asset management system that's in back of the service uh, so the, uh, the client can create uh, can add a content with an ID of X the native asset could have an ID of Y and create a, an attribute, say, called FIMS ID, which is the FIMS value X. Now, when you're retrieving a content object, the ID mapping is done in reverse. So you do get content for X. That calls a query to say, get me the asset where FIMS ID equals X. You find that asset, you load it, and you convert it into a FIMS uh, BM content object where the B FIMS ID is X and the original native asset ID of Y is, is available as a description. Okay, so when you're reading content, it's one thing to get the content, then 
an application is likely want, going to uh, want to get the information or the metadata from that content object. So uh, BM content objects contain descriptions and formats. We're going to focus on descriptions uh, for this part. Uh, we'll go back to formats when covering essence. Uh, but for descriptions, uh, the description values are derived from EBU core. It includes things like title, subject, identifier, description, things like that. Um, and so those values are there, but FIMS also provides uh, an extension mechanism, actually two of them. Uh, a simple one, which is called extension attributes, and a more complex one called an extension group. These will be covered in the next couple slides. For the simple version, we're talking about extension attributes. So to read these custom values, you look for an existing field from the BM content description type. So one of them would be, it could be identifier or maybe description. Um, and so once you find this field, you can look at the type label string to identify the extension. So for example, if I want to add um, an EIDR number, uh, it's a it's a label that's used uh, for tracking content. Um, you could find an identifier and then look to see if there's an identifier with the type label string EIDR. The second option is more difficult, but allows for a much more arbitrary extension. Whereas the previous version was bound to the uh, EBU core attributes, this is a model that allows you to have uh, arbitrary data. Uh, that's attached to the BM content. So you can add custom XML elements, uh, but they must be declared in an X XSD. Um, software can be generated from that XSD uh, if you want to load that, uh, or the XSD may need to be imported if you want to do it more dynamically than with a sort of a static generation, uh, or if you just want to parse uh, the content from reading the XSD. But in any case, it's going to be uh, critical for the client application to understand the structure of the extension in order to get any data out of it and make sense out of it. So here's a code example, a little background uh, for the code example. Um, one way to get uh, a reference implementation uh, started is if you program in Java is to generate Java source classes from the WSDL and XSD files that come with the uh, FIMS uh, 1.1 distribution. Um, to do this you can run a, the Apache CXF application or script WSDL to Java uh, and you run it on the repository WSDL file that's the top level file uh, and that's going to create Java code. Now you can create the directory for the output with the minus D option, and this does create the full SOAP uh, structure. So it'll create the, uh, the request messages and responses and basically set you up so that all you have to do is hook up these objects to a SOAP infrastructure, for example, CXF. Um, but in this case, the parameter object types, for example, add content request type and some of the core types uh, in the, uh, the BMS core, those can also be used for REST web services. Uh, and these objects are annotated for XML serialization, deserialization versus via Jaxby, which means that uh, you don't even have to uh, manually parse the objects. Uh, you can just use the Jaxby code to marshal and unmarshal uh, from the objects to strings and vice versa. So uh, using, uh, in this example, uh, the Apache CXF version 2.6.2, uh, if you look at the bin calling the wisdle 2 javabatch script on Windows, uh, there's two options, a client option and a server option. Um, the minus D for the client is Java client. For the server, it's just Java. Uh, and then you run it on the repository dash v1 underscore one underscore zero dot wisdl, and uh, you get your Java objects. So here's some uh, an example piece of code to um, get a on a content object and then uh, look at some metadata. Now it doesn't get into any uh, low-level detail. This is really just a very high-level uh, indication of how the code works. Uh, and uh, this important thing here is that the uh, get content call does throw an exception. Uh, so it can throw a fault, for example, if there's no SOAP server listening uh, or if the SOAP reports back that there's a malformed uh, request. Uh, if, I've not put that in for brevity here, just getting to the uh, essential nature of the code example. 
So we start by creating a new content type object and we set the resource ID of that content to be the ID of the content we want to get. So we've, we've say we've identified the ID for the content we're interested in. We set the resource ID to that ID. Um, we now uh, issue or we create a new get content request type object and that's going to be uh, passed down uh, to the SOAP call. Uh, we set the content to be the content object we've we've built before and that's really just to carry the um, the ID and then we set the fill set the filter which is for metadata and there's a couple different uh, options for the filter you can say full you can say minimum you can say metadata or you can say physical physical will just return the information related to the essence full returns metadata plus physical uh, and the metadata is just the descriptions so we build a, a response type result uh, and call our implementation. Um, this is a repository uh, client implementation. Say get content, handing in the request object. Now the result has, uh, this is assuming the result is successful. We can say get the content, which says give me the content object that, that was returned. Get its descriptions. We walk through the descriptions. Notice here that we're uh, in the TV FIMS base name base at this point, and there's a collision. Obviously, there's if you look further down, there's another description type, but this is TV FIMS description description type as opposed to the base description type. A little confusing, but hopefully it's not too much to uh, to get through. Um, so we uh, go through the the description. Uh, <laughs> At some level, we get down to the actual uh, elements, and then we can say get value that gives us the string. And uh, if we so choose, we can get the type label if there is one there that helps us identify uh, any extensions. So the reason handling the results, um, we've we've gone through a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to add the rest part. So any successful result. As, as we've seen, returns a copy of the BM content uh, in the response. We've seen in the SOAP that the result is in a get content response type object. Um, and then you can pull the get the content out of that. For, res for REST calls, the response body contains the BM cont content object. Um, so in this example here, um, uh, this is using uh, a, a simple REST package. Uh, saying here that the content type return content equals response.readEntity that's going to uh, uh, cast the content type or cast the, the contents of the result to the content type class. For error cases in both SOAP and REST app implementations an error result eventually returns a repository fault type object. SOAP wraps it in a repository fault message. Um, in REST, it's returned in the response body. Uh, and inside that fault type object is an, it, our error, is an error code, detailed error codes or extended error codes, and other uh, inner details uh, that, that can give, you, give the client application information about why uh, the um, request failed. And if that's presented to the user at some level, the, uh, if it's a correctable problem, then a recovery strategy can be implemented and, and uh, dealt with. As one really helpful part of the, uh, the, the FIMS API is that um, if you want to get a number of objects in sort of one batch, uh, there's a better alternative than to have to call the get content SOAP request every single time there's a get content collection endpoint that can be used. Uh, and this is really uh, simple. There's nothing additional uh, from the get content call except that instead of passing in a single BM content object with the requested ID, a list of objects, each with a different ID, are supplied. And then otherwise, the behavior is the same as get content, including the filter. Okay, let's switch to essence now that we've covered content. Um, so content that, has, that is in the repository may have associated essence. Um, all essence that's associated with the content should contain, contain the same sounds and images, i.e. 
be the same material. Um, it's really not possible to differentiate between the different instances of essence that's associated with content other than uh, in differences of location or in format. But there's really no way of saying that this is the uh, cut two, or this is cut three, or, or any other kinds of uh, differentiators. So really, it really should be uh, the exact same material. Uh, examples of multiple essences is having, say, a high resolution broadcast format and then a low resolution or low bandwidth proxy format um, that you can use to preview content. Um, now, for any given retrieve instance operation, you can retrieve um, one format in really one location. So, since any given uh, essence location has a single format, that's, that's why we have this limitation. So, in order to download essence files, both the it, this is the same as add essence, both the client and the repository must have access to a common storage location. The repository is responsible for setting up that location and identifying it to the client via the RCR. Now, once the retrieve essence call is completed and the, the file is downloaded into the common storage, the client owns that file must manage them appropriately, including removing those files when the whatever operation is desired is, is finished and that es those essence files are no longer needed. Now, there is one exception to that, is that if the essence files are man maintained in the common storage location, then a download isn't necessary and there's no ownership transfer. So it's, it's recommended that the client looks at the essence locators to see if the files are in the common location or if they aren't. And if they are, then they should just be used from that location and not deleted. If they aren't, they should be retrieved to that location and then the client owns those files. So here's the a diagram that shows the uh, relationship of storage between the client and the repository. So the repository could have private storage or could use common storage, but the first thing that happens is the client gets the supported source locations from the repository. Then uh, we have a scenario where either the repository uh, uses the common storage in place so the client can use it directly or B, that the repository will copy the essence from private storage into the common storage, and then the client owns those files. So it just a, it's just a matter of whether or not the uh, uh, repository has copied or not makes a difference of whether or not the client owns the files. So to read the essence, first thing we have to do is identify the essence by calling get content. And what that's going to do is that's going to retrieve the BM content object that corresponds to the asset, which then contains the BM content format object that describes the format of the essence. And the client can look through the format objects to find the right format. And then there's the essence locator objects that describe the actual essence files as stored in the commonly accessible uh, storage system. And so once those are uh, all identified, the client can determine whether or not it can just use the files as is or if it needs to retrieve them. To understand uh, whether or not the which format is the right version, uh, the client will look at technical metadata in the BM content format. Now remember that uh, the full or physical filters must be specified in the get content call in order to retrieve the information about all these essences that are associated with that content. After the client software does a get content and then walks through the content format types, uh, the client can find uh, the subformats. There's one for each of video, audio, and data. Video being the, the video details, including the codec and bit depth and things like that. Audio, sample width, sample rate, and data for things like closed captioning, etc. Uh, now, once the format type has been matched, uh, and that the right format has been identified. The format type also contains the essence locators. Uh, and then once you find the, the essence locator that's relevant, uh, the essence files can be retrieved. 
Now, as in the add content call, retrieve essence is an asynchronous operation. It requires a callback to receive status and result data. If the callback mechanism is not used, then the client cannot know the result of the operation. Clients must use the reply to and fault to parameters to establish the callback endpoints. And for REST, this is the base URL for the client's endpoint to where the uh, results and or faults can be delivered. So the details of this is, is that once the locator and the destination path are added to the retrieve essence request object, the retrieve essence call can be made and that returns an ACK object, retrieve essence operation ACK, or it returns a repository fault object if there's a, an error right away. Now the ACK contains a timestamp and an operation ID, and this operation ID is used to correlate a later result of fault with this request right now. So you match the, the client matches the ID of the result to the ID of the request, and then it knows which result goes with which request. This is just a, a sort of a state diagram that shows how this works, where the client um, issues the uh, get retrieve essence request, gets back an operation acknowledgement, and then later on, at some unknown point in the future, we'll, re we'll receive um, as, a, as an operation uh, a notification, either response or fault, with the same operation ID that was returned back in the uh, Essence Operation ACK object. It's possible to cancel a download. And to do this, you have to... Um, use the operation ID that was returned in the ACK for the, that corresponding retrieve essence call and then call cancel retrieve essence. Now this cancel call is also asynchronous because it may be complicated to execute the operation it is important not to block the result synchronously. Um, so when the uh, when the cancel is either failed or received or re succeeded the appropriate uh, result or fault will be delivered to the fault to result to endpoints. So finally, uh, when the operation either fails or finishes, as mentioned before, message is sent to the either the reply to endpoint or the fault to endpoint. In case of success, a retrieve essence operation notification type will be sent to the reply to endpoint. Um, in case of a failure, it'll be a fault notification type object, and that will be sent to the fault to endpoint. So either reply or fault ob objects will contain that operation ID, so it will be possible to understand for the client which response or re which request this uh, reply or fault corresponds to. One additional element is that the successful notification object that comes to the reply to endpoint will contain a new BM content object reflecting the uh, location of the essence that has been retrieved. And as with the um, add essence operation, um, the retrieve essence operation fault type object will contain error codes uh, along with other additional details in the fault. See documentation for the specifics in the fault notification type. This concludes the FIMS Repository Interface Implementation Guidelines Section 9, Reading Content in Essence, and I hope you've enjoyed it.